So welcome everybody uh, this afternoon to this little webinar on public and active transportation funding. Jim McCauley here, League of Oregon Cities. Um, we wanna provide for as much opportunity for Department of Transportation uh, to kind of walk you through um, the information and provide some time for some questions. So my introductions to this will be very short and probably end in the next 30 seconds. So I think number one, um, feel free to, um, to ask some questions in chat um, and uh, we'll do our best to funnel those forward for, for ODOT staff. Um, I'm gonna let ODOT um, go forward effectively with some introductions on people who are gonna be doing some presentations. Uh, Karen Criswell from ODOT is gonna be the, um, I'll say the primary moderator for this because uh, this is a lot of detail from, from their shop. A lot of interest, obviously, uh, from our members across the state. Pretty transformative transportation uh, investment package back in 2017 that we are all still talking about uh, because we still got a couple more years for full implementation of the revenue, but it was a comprehensive plan. Uh, a lot of different opportunities for some investments in your communities um, across the state. And um, this is one of those areas that we certainly welcome uh, to see greater investment uh, going forward in the future. So with that, uh, I'll turn this over to, to Karen uh, to go for, uh, again, just a couple of brief introductions from her staff. Um, thanks, Jim, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, I guess, giving up your lunch hour or maybe eating and watching us, I'm not sure which, um, uh, to join us this afternoon. My name is Karen Criswell. I am the Public Transportation Division Administrator for ODOT. And our division includes public and active transportation. So the bike ped program, Safe Routes to School. It also includes our passenger rail programs. And um, the division kind of came together, what's it been? A little over a year, April, May, as part of um, the agency's overarching uh, reorganization. And then I've been the administrator of the division just since uh, last February, so relatively new to the position and with me today is Susan Pythman. Susan, you wanna give a little brief intro? Hi, um, so my name is Susan Pythman. I work in the Public Transportation Division at ODOT headquarters and my role is as the Strategic Investments Manager. So I provide leadership over um, our investment programs and support our program managers, which we have two on, on the call, um, Leanne Ferguson, is the Safe Roads to School Program Manager, and Jessica Horning is the Pedestrian Bicycle Program Manager. All right, so we are uh, here with you today to be able to talk with you a little bit about our uh, primary strategic action plan initiative under which these programs fall, and then we'll spend the majority of the time talking about the 24-27 Statewide Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP, and in particular, the pedestrian and bicycle um, strategic plan components of that. We're gonna give you a little uh, bonus uh, side show that we've sort of sandwiched in here, which is ODOT's sort of first look at looking at and thinking about the potential federal reauthorization and in infrastructure funding, and uh, some of what we are looking at coming down the line in terms of both uh, local programs and public and active transportation programs. Uh, recognizing that our staff, uh, Travis Brower, uh, will be working closely with LOC. I believe there's a meeting coming up in the weeks ahead to start to talk about uh, implementation as that funding is coming down the pipeline. So with that, uh, next please. So uh, a little bit of context setting. Uh, in October of 2021, the commission approved uh, a 21-23 strategic action plan. And the plan focuses on three main priorities. And this is under which um, the majority of our policy and funding priorities um, are organized. The three main areas or the three main priorities are equity. So prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion by identifying and addressing systemic barriers to ensure that all Oregonians benefit from transportation services and investments. The second is focusing on a modern transportation system. So building, maintaining, and operating a modern multimodal transportation system that serves all Oregonians, addresses climate change, and that to helps Oregon communities and economies to thrive. 
And then the third major area is sufficient and reliable funding. So making sure that we have the funding that's necessary to support a modern transportation system and importantly, a fiscally sound um, ODOT. So to help achieve these priorities, uh, we identified a number of, of outcomes to support the priorities. The one that our division is charged with is improving access to active and public transportation. So this slide points out some of the major implementing actions and steps that we'll be going through to realize this um, initiative. Some of the thinking and discussion which led up to the commission deciding to direct more money to public and active transportation is the fact that nearly a third of Americans are unable to drive due to age, uh, disability, or because they can't afford a car or because they choose not to, to be a car owner. Um, the lack of multimodal transportation option, options in low income areas and communities of color contributes to higher pedestrian uh, serious injuries and fatalities. Um, you'll hear Susan talk a little bit more about that um, ODOT research that underlies that uh, a little bit farther on in our presentation. But that was, that was some of the thinking, the recognition that not all Oregonians have equitable access to a state transportation system. And what do we need to do to uh, fix those disparities? So it's not only improving access to the system, the second kind of a component to this is when you look at and you think about where we're prioritizing spending. Are we making sure to prioritize that spending so that people who have been disproportionately and are being disproportionately negatively impacted by our system are recognizing the improvements, are seeing greater improvements? So areas where um, people who are uh, experiencing low wages or people uh, where people of color live. So that's sort of the two prongs to it. Uh, next, please. So with that uh, strategic action plan context in mind, let's talk about the SIP. So um, the statewide transportation improvement program for those who may not be familiar is a federal highway administration requirement. And it's basically ODOT's plan for the use of federal funds and some state funds are also noted in the SIP as well. It is not an exhaustive list of programmed funds um, so there's more to our, our funding and the things that we're doing than are listed in the STIP. There are three basic steps that the commission takes when um, programming the STIP. The first one is the allocation of funds um, across categories as well as sub allocations. And that's some of the information that you're seeing on the screen right now. The second step, which we'll get into momentarily is project selection. So once we know how much funding we have to work with for us in public and active transportation, then we need to do the work to identify which projects are gonna get funded by it. And then it, the process rounds out with the commission uh, taking action on approving um, those projects. There is public engagement throughout the process and that is part of what we're doing today. So in December of 2020, um, the commission approved uh, 255 million in um, federal funds, federal and state funds uh, for the public and active transportation. This was a 66% increase over the previous funding allocation. Next, please. That 255 million um, gets split into several sub allocations and programs. Some, and when you look at the content here, you have the programs listed on the far left, then the amount, and then the third column, um, um, far, column to the far right indicates whether that funding is required or if it was discretionary and that was a, a choice the commission made. So what you see on this slide is some funding that's allocated to mass transit improvements. Um, so that's buses and bus replacements in urban areas, funding for that benefit services for older adults and people with disabilities, and then transit vehicle replacement, which is primarily focused at our rural transit providers. Uh, and then there's the transportation options program, which is focused on education and information that helps people to understand the various transportation options that are available to them. And then at the very bottom, passenger rail facility planning and design. So that is some work that helps us to be uh, better prepared to uh, and strategically positioned to apply for federal funds for improving our passenger rail service. Next, please. 
So within the pedestrian and bicycle funding, you see a, a new column, which is uh, the second from the left, which is which system is it a state? Is it for state funding and on the state system, or is it to go to locals, local agencies, and on local systems? So that's an important distinction. Um, we want to highlight the programs primarily today that are focused on the state system. But in general, we're looking at roughly 70 million of bike ped funds specific to the state system with another 10 million for safe routes to school projects on or crossing our state system and approximately 70 million on local systems. So you see in the first row, um, there is the, the funding that is um, the sidewalk improvement program that's funds that are allocated to the various regions of ODOT and they work on the programming of those funds for improving sidewalks. The community paths program, which is off system local agency funding. Uh, we just completed our first round of solicitation for, for those projects. Then we have the bike ped strategic, which is a brand new program and will be the main focus of Susan's presentation. And then uh, you see some safe routes to school education as well as safe routes to school infrastructure funding. Next, please. So I'm, this is the portion of our uh, show where I take a little left turn to talk about um, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and what it is looking like the impact could be on Oregon. Now, to be really overtly clear, not yet, not yet, Susan, easy with your trigger finger. Um, this is not yet money in the bank. This um, reauth the reauthorization and infrastructure bills are still making their way through Congress. Uh, we hope and dream that Congress will take action by uh, the end of the month um, on these bills. But we've already been starting to look at what, um, what the draft language looks like and what it could mean to us. Now, next, please. Um, the infrastructure bill includes both a reauthorization and the extension of the surface transportation programs, as well as increased funding for these programs. It will translate, at least at this moment, it looks like about a billion of additional highway and special program formula funding. So that includes funding for local programs, local agency programs uh, for Oregon over the next five years. It is currently looking like nearly a 40% increase in federal investments to preserve and improve the system. It will also mean nearly 200 million in additional funding for public transportation over five years, which is an increase of more than uh, 30%. And please note that all of the funding numbers that uh, I present today will be five-year totals. Next, please. Um, so right now we're looking at approximately 30 million in additional funding for the Transportation Alternatives Program. Some of this goes directly to the three large MPOs in Oregon, but most of it will run through the Oregon Community Paths Program. And so that will give us the ability to uh, offer additional funding for that grant program. Next. Um, urban and rural areas will see nearly 200 million in additional formula funding for public transportation and passenger rail. Um, the 200 million will include funding for things like buses and bus facilities. And then there are also uh, significant discretionary grants that will be available for passenger rail. Some of this we could use to make improvements that would result in more frequent service, um, reliability and more reliable service. So we're pretty excited about that possibility. Next. And then in the safety um, category, we're looking at more than 40 million in additional funding for the All Roads Transportation Safety or ARTS program. This is a pretty important program for, for all of us here in Oregon in that it finds, it looks for the most cost-effective ways of directing funding to reduce fatalities and serious injuries for all users on all roads, whether they're owned by ODOT, a county, or a city. Next. Local programs. Local programs are anticipated to receive significant increases in funding in a wide variety of programs. So surface transportation block grant funds and transportation alternatives funding that goes to large MPOs, additional funding for local bridge programs, um, additional funding through ODOT's fund sharing agreement with cities, counties, and small MPOs, 
and CMAC or Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Improvement Program funding, and then additional uh, funding for safety projects. Next. Um, the formula funding that will be coming to Oregon is just the start. Secretary Mayor Pete will have a lot of power to award grants as there are tens of billions of dollars in discretionary grant opportunities for roads, transit, rail, and other modes. This is um, likely to include a significant increase for the popular uh, RAISE grants, which used to be known as the Tiger Grants. And that is anticipated to be funded at about $1.5 billion per year. Um, there's also infra grants and low and no emission grants for public transportation. Uh, to be as competitive as possible, we will start to pre-position projects in each grant program, getting them shovel ready um, with planning and design and identifying matching funds. Next, please. And then um, last on this section of slides, while the vast majority of the additional federal highway funding will be dedicated um, by Congress to specific programs. Some of the additional funding will come in from programs that allow the commission to decide how funding will be dedicated across different categories in the STIP. Uh, to allocate the funding, we're anticipating that the commission will follow its normal STIP update process, uh, looking for public input, particularly from ACTS, MPOs, and our modal advisory committees, as well as analyzing the outcomes of different investment options. We think that we got, well, we did receive really robust input on our 24, 27 STIP on those allocations. And I think it's fair to say that we'll be using all of that input the commission has already received last year as a, as a great uh, jumping off point. We would anticipate the commission will decide how to allocate this additional federal funds by early uh, 2022. Uh, with some of the funding programs, if any of you have looked at the, the draft language, some of the funding becomes available immediately and we will need to move really quickly to obligate those funds uh, and get going uh, in order to be competitive and successful. All right, and with that, I will take a pause and take a peek at the chat, see if there's anything there that I need to address. Um, not yet. I've been kind of monitoring. We're, we're working through some some logistics, but no presentation questions yet. Okay. Okay. And oh, I'm Aaron, sorry. Can you clarify what the match for community paths looks like? Susan, do we know that yet? Because it will be a future offering of paths. It's likely to be the 10.27 for the federal portion. For the last, um, the last round of community paths, there was um, another fund, a state fund um, uh, uh, from lottery dollars, the vehicle privilege tax, and the bike registration fee that required that fund required, I believe, a 20% match. Um, but since the big increase, the $36 million that Karen mentioned is all federal, we anticipate that it will be the 10.27. Yeah, good question. All right, and with that, I will turn it to Susan to address this next session. Section. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. That was a really helpful overview and grounding. I hope that um, I was really excited when I saw kind of our breakdown of what we anticipate in the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill. And so, um, as Karen I, mentioned- Pause for one second, sorry, Susan, sorry to interrupt your flow. Karen, there was one more question that got sent directly to me, so I reposted it to everybody, but um, uh, any word, any work on high-speed rail that you know of from that? Uh, you know, there's a lot of chatter about whether and how much funding might be available for high speed rail. Uh, we don't yet know at the state level, and I think this is true for both ODOT and WASHTA, we do not have anything in our budgets that are programmed um, for work on high speed rail. So I guess it remains to be seen what's in the, what comes out of the federal legislation. Thanks. Um, now this time we really mean it. Back to Susan. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? It's totally cool. If uh, you guys need to interrupt me, I can get knocked off and get back on. All right. So 
Karen gave that broad overview of the 24, 27 step categories at the beginning before she uh, went into kind of the federal like overview of what could possibly be coming to Oregon. I want to go into more specifics around the pedestrian and bicycle strategic program. So a little bit additional grounding on why an increase in funding on pedestrian and bicycle for pedestrian and bicycle um, projects. So a couple stats for you. Um, across the country, there's been a 35% increase in pedestrian fatalities over the last 10 years, um, while there's been a decrease of 6% for pedestrian or motorist fatalities. So that's an inverse. That's not the direction we want to be going with any of the, uh, with pedestrian fatalities at all. Um, also, this is a great one. 50% of all trips are less than three miles. It's very comfortable and easy 15-minute um, bicycle trip. Uh, on the Oregon State system. Um, our pedestrian bicycle network is only 63% complete. That does not make a true network. So we really need to address those gaps. Um, going to hit that sustainability one down there in the middle, which is a uh, really critical 40% of our emissions in Oregon come from the transportation sector. And then as Karen alluded earlier um, on um, getting into some of our equity research, really understanding the impacts of our decision making on um, on communities of color of historically underserved communities has been a really important um, undertaking that our agency has been going through, including um, wanted to highlight some of our research findings as of late. So um, uh, Dr. Nathan McNeil from Portland State and uh, our researcher at ODOT, Josh Roll, um, just recently published the Understanding Pedestrian Injuries and social equity. Um, some of the findings from that including, include Black, Indigenous, and people of color experience a higher pedestrian injury burden than the average Oregonian. Census tracts with high poverty rates experience higher rates of pedestrian injury than the statewide average. And then people in high poverty census tracts are more likely to walk and take transit to meet their daily needs, along with there's a larger concentration of arterial roadway traffic in these. So, um, so just just to kind of sum up, uh, in poverty or in uh, census tracts with high poverty rates, you've got more people walking and biking. You have um, a higher concentration of arterial traffic, um, and uh, you also have more people, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, experiencing a higher pedestrian injury burden. So that information is really um, critical and important, as as and should inform the development of our funding programs and project selection. So uh, as Karen mentioned earlier, we have this kind of set of programs within the 24-27 step that she went through. And I'm going to talk about these two that are highlighted in the red box. This is the ODOT Pedestrian Bicycle Strategic at 45 million and the Safe Routes to School, ODOT Safe Routes to School infrastructure at 10 million. So a total of $55 million of federal funds for the state system. This is important um, for us from an administrative standpoint to kind of put them together and then say, we're gonna ensure that $10 million of the 55 million will result in improved access to school. I'm gonna stop here and make a note about um, House Bill 2017 Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Grant. Um, in the development of the 24-27 STIP, there was a lot of feedback that we got received around um, more money for local agents. Right, so more money for grants for local agencies. Um, ODOT then made the policy decision to um, to allocate ten million dollars of federal funds for access to schools, and then during that same time frame of twenty four twenty seven, remove ourselves as an eligible participant to the House Bill twenty seventeen infrastructure grant, therefore making more money available to local agencies. So I'm going to repeat that ODOT, even though we're an eligible applicant for the House Bill twenty seventeen um, Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Grant Program that Leanne Ferguson manages, we're not going to be uh, applying for any of those funds because we're using federal funds to fund uh, Safe Routes to School projects on the state system. So, hang on, I've got a, oops, apologies for that. So as I mentioned, these are federal funds for the state system. We used a data-driven approach to identify and develop projects um, at these key project locations. And I wanna make sure that we're 
kind of grounded in what kind of projects we're talking about for these funds. We're talking about sidewalks, we're talking about bicycle facilities, including buffered and physically protected bike lanes, pedestrian crossings, multi-use crossings, off-street paths is parallel to an ODOT facility. Some of you may be familiar that the um, highway fund, Oregon's highway fund has a right of way restriction. We can't actually pay for those high quality, high demand, high safety multi-use paths that are outside the road right of way using those funds. But since we're using federal funds, um, we can actually build a parallel or um, we can build multi-use paths off the road right of way and also illumination. So our pedestrian and bicycle strategic program goals. Um, our goals include, um, goals are kind of overarching goals for the program include addressing gaps for people walking and biking on the state system. As I provided that statistic earlier, we are very far from a, com ne a complete network on the state system. Hey, Susan. Um, yes. Susan, you've had a request to slow down your speed of speaking. Sorry about and that. Speak a little bit more loudly. Okay. Um, can, is this? I'll hold my microphone closer. Um, so our head bike strategic program goals as we were developing um, this, this program include addressing gaps for people walking and biking on the state system, um, specifically missing sidewalks, bike lanes, and crossings are of critical importance. Looking to, we are also looking to prioritize projects at locations that provide that equity and safety benefit. And that's where the research and understanding of, of the pedestrian injuries, uh, serious injuries and fatalities um, is really important to help guide the, our prioritization of where this money is going. Also looking um, to identify cost savings through leverage with other ODOT projects. So um, it's federal money. Federal money can be expensive to administer. And so it's good policy to kind of make the best use of funds by adding to another federal project. However, we want to make sure that it makes sense to, it, we're not just talking about leverage for leverage sake. We're talking about um, combining projects together if they make sense to combine at the highest need locations. Um, and so we're talking about things like um, coordinating with repaving or curb ramp foot replacement, those kind of projects, adding them together to make the best use of our funds, okay? And so I keep mentioning highest need locations. Um, how are those identified? So in March of 2021, um, we recently completed our active transportation needs inventory. This is a management system. Um, this is a management system that informs investment. This is an inventory of our existing pedestrian and bicycle and shoulder facilities on state highways. This is just the state system. Um, and it's an assessment of the existing facilities relative to our design standards. We also then evaluate those gaps and deficiencies using evaluation criteria to result in a prioritization of those high need locations. And then those high need locations have guided the project locations um, for this pedestrian bicycle strategic fund. So we wanted to kind of quickly go through some of the data that is included in the active transportation needs inventory. The information that is included includes the crash history and the crash risk factors. Some of those risk factors include things like the uh, traffic volumes, the width of the roadway, the speed of the roadway, the level of traffic stress, that's specifically for bicycle, um, bicycles only, the access to transit and essential destinations, whether or not a location fills a gap in the system, a look at if the, uh, if the location is in a transportation disadvantaged community. So now I've got another slide on that in a second. Um, respiratory hazards, economic development through tourism, um, needs if a need is identified in a local plan, and the existing presence and condition of a facility. So wanted to uh, also provide a little bit more information on our transportation disadvantaged index. So this is safety and equity in our prioritization of our um, active transportation needs inventory um, are the two highest ranking characteristics. And so the transportation disadvantage index is the kind of equity component that we use in that prioritization. I wanted to say, that the information in there includes um, the kind of the characteristics include age-based, so over 65 or under 18, non-white and Hispanic populations, low income, 
limited English proficiency, no access to a vehicle, and people with disabilities, and crowded households. So we have that information. We have our active transportation needs inventory. How do we actually select the projects for this PED Bike Strategic Fund? So we wanted to state we have an emphasis both on kind of the cost effectiveness, and that's that leverage piece, along with project readiness and our agency's capacity to deliver at the regions. So those are really important additional lenses that we put on the project selection, um, because whatever we select, we want to make sure that we can get that project ready and out the door and built and on the ground. Um, so what we did, we also wanted to ensure that the projects are in those top 10% of the at any locations. Um, unless it is a, a community under 5,000 and it's a safe routes to school project. Remember, we were trying to hit on that $10 million set aside for safe routes to school projects. So um, we had a couple of projects ready to go, but we wanted to make sure for the safe routes to school projects, we want to make sure they're in the top 20% of the at any locations. And we wanted to leverage with other ODOT projects. So how did we do that? So uh, our, best, our vice, pedestrian and bicycle program manager, Jessica Horning, she went around to all of the other funding program managers in ODOT and said, okay, so you manage the pavement preservation program. What are, it's on your priority list for 24-27. All right, ADA program, what's on your list for 24-27? She gathered up that data and then compared it to our high needs locations and to identify those leverage opportunities and if it makes sense to leverage. So something, an example of making good sense to leverage an ADA curb ramp and a sidewalk together. So that's kind of how we were trying to make the best use of that $55 million to let it go as far as we can get it to go. Um, and then we did develop some standalone locations, but they needed to be at the very, very top, the one to 5% of those high need um, locations identified through the ATME. So we have our 150% project list and across the state we've got 36 projects. We have eight of them that we're identifying in that kind of safe routes to school category, uh, along with 28 for the PED bike strategic. Right now, we're in the process of scoping 31 of those, but we're also trying to get creative as well to say, okay, you know, we may have a better funding source over here. Let's see if we can um, move these up for advanced delivery in 24 27, because um, we see some opportunities to get them on the ground um, as soon as possible. Or we may say, okay, there's some more, a better, a different type of fund that would uh, actually make more sense to develop this project. So, but we wanted to include all 36 of those projects for feedback um, on our online open house that we are just about ready to launch. So the online open house. Um, our next, actually, I'm gonna skip. Okay, so our public involvement. Um, so we have our PED bike strategic webpage. And one of the big values of um, the public transportation division is uh, transparency uh, and uh, public involvement engagement. And so we wanted to make sure that in the for this new funding program, we absolutely had as much information as possible up on, um, uh, on a webpage for, for, for people to educate themselves on the program. We're also having discussions with the area commissions on transportation, um, uh, the ODOT advisory committee is also uh, being here as a great example as well. Um, and then we have our online open house. And so I put a little screenshot over there on the right. I think Leanne Ferguson is going to put the link in the chat. But um, that is going to be open from September, like now, 14th, I think today. Uh, we were officially going to launch it tomorrow with a, with a notice going out. Um, but it's live and ready for, uh, for people's feedback. Um, so uh, that will be open until the end of October. And then we're really hoping that you can help us spread the word about the online open house and uh, send it out to any of your uh, constituents would be really helpful. Okay, now I'm gonna pop back up to next steps. So I mentioned the online open house. Uh, we're working also on scoping. Um, we'll then refine our list down from 150% to 100. We're also trying to get kind of um, get projects starting as soon as we possibly can uh, by moving a preliminary engineering phase into 21 to 24 timeframes. So get things moving as quickly as we can. 
Also, uh, we want to further develop the project concepts from um, our active transportation needs inventory and work with partners to proactively identify additional opportunities for future steps or as Karen highlighted, some, um, any additional funding opportunities coming down from um, additional infrastructure spending at the federal level. Okay, so I recognize that we were talking about state, um, federal funding on the state system and wanted to emphasize that there are um, additional grant programs available for local agencies that we didn't get into a ton of detail, um, but the information is available on our website. Um, and kind of the main ones being the Community Path Grant, and that was actually um, 36 million going into 24, 27. That's a six fold increase from the level of federal funding that we had available from 21 to 24. Um, and also uh, the Safe Routes to House Bill 2017 Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Grant, that increased from uh, $10 million a year to $15 million a year in 2023. Um, and so that, that's another great increase as well. Um, and then we also have Safe Routes to School Education Grants. It's out of our shop, but we work closely with that, um, with that part of the agency uh, for education encouragement uh, programs for students. All right, so key contacts. Um, you've got my email there. Um, Jessica Horning is our pedestrian and bicycle program manager and Leanne Ferguson um, is our state fruits to school program manager. Um, those, the three of us plus a couple of other folks have been the project management team trying to get this ped bike strategic program off the ground as quickly as we can and in, as intentionally as we can. And uh, the three of us are on to happily answer any questions you have about the ped bike strategic program. However, if you've got questions or comments about uh, projects specifically, I encourage you to go to the online open house and take the survey. Um, we'd really love your feedback, especially written down. That would be really helpful. I see 20 comments in my chat and I'm sure about five of them were telling me to slow down. So. At least 10 of them are Leanne and um, Jessica responding to questions. So I'm not okay. sure if there's anything outstanding in the chat. Nothing is outstanding in the chat that I can see, but people are welcome to continue to put in questions. Um, So Alex Bowman has a fantastic question, which I love very much, which is, are there plans or mechanisms for extending the active transportation's needs inventory to non-ODOT facilities, which is a common conversation we have here. Susan, you want to take a crack take, at that? I'll take a quick stab and like everything, if I get information wrong, Jessica can come in and correct me. Um, so the recently, okay, so two things. One is uh, we have um, the pedestrian and bicycle program and Jessica Horning have um, been leading a uh, per like performance, uh, performance measures and metric work. And with a long-term desire to have um, a, a statewide performance metric on the completion of the system, which would require some sort of statewide inventory, okay? That we do not currently have. Um, Additionally, um, separately, but uh, thankfully somewhat coordinated, the um, DLCD is undergoing their uh, update to their transportation rulemaking, um, transportation planning rule um, right now. And in their draft, they're working on um, how to encourage, require an inventory at the local level. Um, and uh, and so the question, if that does go through, um, we'd be working, ODOT would be working um, on our guidance to support um, some sort of statewide um, active transportation needs inventory-ish thing, who knows what the name would be. So there's work happening on the horizon around that, but none of it is official or funded yet. It's intended. 
I would say um, it is extremely useful for us to have uh, feedback or to hear from folks if you think that is a good idea to help agencies to better prioritize um, infrastructure investments on local systems and to, for us to really look at the system as a complete system and not it's people don't care whose jurisdiction it's in they care if they can get from where they are to where they want to be and so I think our job uh, for those of us on who are who work for public agencies is to figure out how to do that and to to be um, more jurisdictionally blind in that area so as we're looking at and thinking about um, flexible federal funds, this could be one area where um, where we might choose to focus um, those funds or where some of you might choose to focus the funds. So happy to get uh, your feedback on that. And Jim, as a LOC staffer, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that based on feedback you hear from your members. Yeah, I don't think I've got anything um directly. I know it's we always have a mix of, of interest and in scale and scope and things of that nature. I think the one thing that's um, been pretty consistent is there's an off it's a it's widespread interest in this. It isn't confined just to larger cities um, and things of that nature. The interest is out there for a cross section of who our membership is. Thank you. I know for a long time we didn't certain people didn't really realize how popular public transportation was, for example, in rural areas. And then years ago in the run up to the 2017 legislative session, uh, when the then governor and then the, um, the then joint committee was out uh, kind of doing the circuit ride around the state and heard really strongly from constituents statewide that public transportation was extremely important to them. I think that was an eye opener for a lot of people. And I think that I think that exists to some extent as well as it relates to the, the ped bike community and the ways with which people want to travel around in, in all parts of the state. It, does, it doesn't look the same probably it, across the state, but I think there is, are still statewide needs that we hear about. So that's my color commentary on that. Yeah, no, I think that's that's fair. I mean, I had a chance to go to all of those uh, public hearings across the state. And again, it didn't make any difference whether you were on coastal Oregon, Hermiston, Southeast, it doesn't make, every place had a significant need for the um, trans, transit um, shuttle service, something. Um, I remember, you know, a number of different uh, folks providing um, some input during that process uh, related to medical. Just the ability to go to a doctor um, was incredibly limiting to a large chunk of some of these isolated population or isolated areas in rural Oregon, but also individuals who didn't have transportation available to them. So it was uh, taxis uh, in many respects or trying to hitch a ride with you know some neighbor or some friend to get them there and having some kind of a dependable shuttle service um, and um, some kind of a coordinated or integrated program. And some of these communities really help, will help draw them together over time. There's, um, I was checking out the chat and the first one, Jules. Um, Jules had a really important question. I think they were kind of, I actually was thinking of answering it in like a two part. Um, regarding orphan highways, I'm so sorry. Um, a topic that comes up often regarding orphan highways is maintenance of the roadway when any of the funding sources address the needs for paving and repair. Um, Jules, it's a, we're on a separate program. We're, we're basically adding sidewalk crossing but as our um, bicycle infrastructure. So with the ped bike strategic funds, we uh, it isn't money to address maintenance or um, repaving specifically or repair. Um, however, I would say orphan, we're, we recognize from our chair um, within the agencies, the impact of kind of disinvestment on um, quote unquote or, orphan highways. Um, and uh, also some of the safety implications of that from a pedestrian, um, a pedestrian injury and fatality standpoint. 
Um, as you noticed, we're trying to like leverage on projects to make the best bang for our buck. Um, and if a, a location doesn't have a project to leverage onto, it's a lot more expensive for us. And so one of the things that we're working on through the strategic action plan is to identify kind of the, um, to identify the multimodal uh, priority network for the state and then prioritize that not um, kind of dependent on, uh, so, so that re like something like repaving um, isn't dependent on um, kind of paving condition. It's more like we can encourage kind of a, a greater investment on a specific corridor um, or locations based on more of a, a, a population, a safety need, things like that um, to kind of address the, the, the um, disinvestment that's happened on some of those more expensive highways. I think to tag onto that really briefly, federal, I know we're covering multiple funding sources in this presentation, but in terms of federal funds, federal um, funds cannot be used for maintenance, but what they can be used for is if we're able to apply them to capital priorities, that could potentially free up more state funds that could be used um, for maintenance. So it's, um, it, it does give us a bit more flexibility to have those additional federal funds. Let's see, Alex, 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 Alex had a comment about uh, here in Eugene, there isn't much of a network just considering ODOT facilities, so would appreciate seeing this applied more broadly. Um, I, you know, Alex, thank you for that. I think that there is, um, you know, there's work to do. We all have some work to do in this area, right? Um, so in terms of what the local priorities are, you know, local local agencies um, get to determine their priorities as well. But hopefully it's something that uh, we can partner on or that we can share what we have learned from our experience in doing the active transportation needs inventory and the kind of data that we use in criteria and so forth. And then going back to the, Alex, going back to the transportation planning rule update in some of the drafts that I've also seen, it's had that kind of prioritization, like more of a prioritization for at least, um, and a greenhouse gas review of at least like the, the federal funding that some agencies get. Uh, so uh, I under, I hear your point on kind of inconsistent prioritization methodology. Um, looking at Richard Shepard's follow-up question, which seems like there's a lot to unpack in it, which <laughs> is that the BIF, the federal funds, includes additional billion for highways. Is there some discretion as to how much of that can be reallocated for bike, ped, knees, or jurisdictional transfers? Um, so within that billion, I'm not sure. So what we would look at first is what is being allocated by formula, and then what portions are discretionary. And then within the portions that are discretionary, that's where we would look at whether it's um, putting some dollar figure amount to 82nd Avenue, for example, which the legislature has allocated funds for that and both ODOT and our partners also need to come up with some funds for that jurisdictional transfer. So that could be a, a source of uh, funding for a JT uh, jurisdictional transfer, for example. And that discretionary funding can also be a place for allocation to the bike ped programs. And I know that we are definitely looking at that as, a, as an agency. So going down to Mary's comment. You mean take that one, Karen? Sure. OK. Um, this is tough. It is tough because we're at a, for example, we have for ped bikes. Okay, her her comment, which is totally um, appropriate, appropriate, good, important, is um, you know kind of the the low being a low need city of West Lynn that has Highway 43. Um, just the frustration being told the funding is going to other places and um, I you know as we say like the high the high need locations when everybody's. Um, everyone's corridor, especially uh, state highways with the high volumes, high speeds are high needs from a pedestrian and bicycle uh, safety standpoint. Um, how can I advocate for this? Uh, the $55 million that we have for the Ped Bike Strategic doesn't go nearly as far as we would like it to. I mean, it's just hitting 
36 projects across the state. And that is, that just is still unfortunately just scratches the surface of the needs. Um, in terms of um, advocating specifically I, uh, for your project and within like head bike strategic, we're, we're, we're doing a data-driven approach um, using the active transportation needs inventory. However, I do encourage you to uh, bring up um, kind of the, the additional need for investment in your community, like at any place that you can, including um, that is information that I think has been really helpful at the um, through different area commissions and transportation, and then also with the Oregon Transportation Commission in terms of identifying um, where there are needs in different communities, um, and basically like where we need where we need to put more money. So Susan, I'm gonna flag also that Jessica pasted it in the chat for Mary that uh, she thinks that Metro's flex regional flexible funding program has identified some potential improvements for Oregon 43. So that's in there as well. And then um, Holly was looking at the ATNI map and had some questions specifically about the city of Waldport and 101. And I think that um, Jessica also responded to Holly with some potential improvements that are on the 150% list. I think the other overarching thing that I would say is um, we know the needs far, far outweigh the funding that's available. We in fact keep track of by how much the needs outweigh the funding that's available. And I think maybe one of the things that um, I would flag is just making sure that you are having those conversations um, when local communities, um, that you're bringing that awareness to local and state elected officials. I know that um, there were many local elected officials that signed up for this webinar. So um, you're hearing some of that information right now. Uh, and then I think traditionally the state roughly every eight years has a trans transportation funding package. We had the last package in 2017. If uh, history repeats itself in this case, we'd be then looking at another transportation funding package, you know, coming up, you know, first run maybe in the uh, in the 23, 2023 session, and then maybe something getting passed in 2025. So I think continuing to build understanding of both the needs and the opportunities, you know, what are the current levels of funding investments getting us and what could uh, additional investments get us. So that is my not lobbying information sharing component of the program, because it would be wrong to lobby. Um, Jim is smiling knowingly. Yes, we're walking the line, always walking the important line. Uh, Megan has a question, which is, have demonstration projects or pilots been funded on ODOT highways? And I think the answer is we have many examples of improvements that we have done, and I would turn it to program staff to highlight anything they want to shine a light on. Jessica, do you have specific examples? Um, yeah, I think the we have done some demonstration projects on state highways, and I think uh, Megan's probably familiar with one of our most successful ones uh, in Hood River in the Heights uh, neighborhood that was funded with a ODOT Transportation Options Innovation Grant. Um, so we that is that is still a program that we have we are trying to figure out um some more consistent uh procedures for doing those sort of pop-up demonstration uh projects when they are on state highways because uh there are some unique maintenance needs and um considerations when because our facilities tend to be kind of uh, higher volume, higher speeds than the local streets where you typically have those sorts of projects like a, a Sunday Parkways or um, a, a pop-up parklet or something like that. So it, it's something we are, are still talking about. It wouldn't be something that we're funding through this uh, federal source of funding though. It would still probably be through our transportation options program. I think we're at about time. Um, I just on my last final pitch, um, please 
participate in the online open house. Um, we really, uh, for better or for worse, the staff working on um, pedestrian bicycle uh, issues at ODOT are extremely passionate and want to improve Oregon for the better. And so having your comments and feedback is really helpful for us. So this is my impassion plea to participate in the online open house. It'll take you like 10 minutes. And my, my last thing is just to say thank you very much again for your, your interest and your time. And we really appreciate that you're here. Jim, anything uh, before we say goodbye for now? I don't think so. I think uh, we'll certainly make these slides available. Um, we always take our webinars and put them up physically on our website. So um, longevity of this and stuff is certainly going to run it. Uh, past today. Uh, we'll probably even mention this certainly in our weekly bulletin in terms of access. I think one of the things I'm thinking about right now is I kind of wonder if we need to look at um, putting together a portal uh, for a transportation funding portal and, with, and work with ODOT on this so that there's kind of like a one-stop location, especially once we get some federal money, provided that we get an infrastructure package moving through. Um, because I just think it seems to make some sense for um, not just cities, but obviously you know, county partners and stuff to um, make sure that this stuff is accessible and there's one place to go to, uh, especially I think for some of the smaller communities that may not have the resources or planning staff or transportation expertise. So. Yeah, we can absolutely help you with that. We have some various um, groupings and, and we can provide some links and work with you or your staff on that um, and coordinate offline right. funding opportunities. Because we also have changes in STBG program, you know, moving forward too. So, you know, I'm beginning to think you just start looking at different layers um, and the complexity that's out there and the different funding streams and the color of the money and things of that nature. And, um, maybe it makes some sense to try to make it a little bit more uh, user friendly to at least try to identify. You are you are 100% flagging one of my very hot spot passions, which is, you know, we can have a particular and this is not news to you, we can have a particular project where we could be bringing something like 15 different sources of funding to bear each coming with it its own strings attached. And so for us with defining a priority multimodal corridor and getting clear on what are the outcomes that we're trying to get to? And then how do you bend the funding to its will to actually get the outcomes that, that you want? And how can we try to have that flexibility wherever we can and trying to make it as seamless as possible and as easy to access as possible for um, our local agency partners? And so that's sort of a long-term vision um, that we're focused on. And as you know, with the complexities of the funding world, it's a pretty lofty it's a pretty lofty goal, but I'm here for it, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Well, something for us to work on. I don't think we'll get it done in the next six months. but uh, <laughs> Or before um, we die, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, something for us to certainly work towards. Jim, can I ask you a quick question? We've had a couple of questions about when folks might be able to receive the PowerPoint presentation or the recording for this. Do you have a timeline on that? And um, yeah, There's so let me see if uh, Julie Oak is available. Julie has a better sense. Yeah, um, I would say okay, we can probably by in the next day or two, we'll, we can email it out to everyone that was registered and then also um, have it available on our LOC site. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. I think Karen had to hop to the next meeting. I'll bet everybody else. Yeah. Did. Jim, you want to say, you want to call us yeah. done? Yeah, no, uh, we're finito. Thank you very much again, <laughs> Oda, everybody. Uh, this was great. Appreciate the opportunity on the webinar. And I have a sense that we'll probably be doing something certainly on SKBG because of the changes taking place in 22 here in the next month or so. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.